Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. Let's start off with some literary. And this is an article called Olympic Thinking that we had already started and we'll finish it up. Ready? Here we go. Olympic thinkers seek feedback. Do you look for ways to be better? Do you seek constructive input? Are you coachable? People with high standards seek feedback. As a court reporter, you can seek feedback from your clients, your leaders, and other top advisors about the quality of your work, client relationships, and how you run your business. Every person with high standards can find a way to get feedback. If you can't find a source of feedback for free, hire it. It will quick, quickly pay for itself. Feedback serves as the measurement system for improvement. Feedback sets the benchmarks for achieving the high standards you have set for yourself. Feedback, not Wheaties, is the true breakfast of champions, Norman Vincent Peale once said. Unfortunately, most people would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. This doesn't mean you have to subject yourself to abuse. It does mean you should seek feedback from people who will tell you the truth, not just make you feel good. Olympic thinkers seek, seek feedback and welcome input to improve. Why become an Olympic thinker? Having the high standards of the Olympic thinker will help you become an even more successful professional, but more importantly, Olympic thinking will impact your total quality of life and how you feel about yourself. Be an Olympic, Olympic thinker, raise your standards, and your performance will improve directly. All right, now let's try some jury charge. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ready? Here we go. Your duty is to determine whether the defendant could have avoided the accident. You must not base your decision on speculation. You must base your decision on the facts alone. In doing so, you must keep in mind that there has been testimony stricken from the record. The testimony is not to be considered in your decision. You must not include this testimony when you are making your decision as to the facts in this case. You may not consider evidence that was stricken from the record that must be treated as though you had never known it. You must also keep in mind that standing alone a question is not evidence. You may not consider it as evidence. If you have a question with regard to the law as I indicated, you are to get the bailiff to take the question or questions to me. I will answer your questions as best I can. I will be in my chamber, so I will be here to answer any questions that you may have. You may look at the diagram or any other evidence that you need to review in order to make your decision. This case involves a company automobile and a corporation. With regard to business entities, you must know the law. The fact that this case involves a business entity should not prejudice you in your deliberations or in your verdict. You must treat the business entity as a person. In the eyes of the law, a business entity is not a person is a person. That entity is entitled to the same fair and impartial considerations and to justice by the same legal standards. With regard to the business entity, you must keep in mind that it is being charged with the responsibility for the accident. You must keep in mind that the suit involves both individuals and the corporation. The law that applies in this case determines how the responsibility will fall. You must not be prejudiced in any way against the accident involving a company vehicle. You must not believe a company to be above the law. On the other hand, you must not punish a company because you think it has power above an individual. The company and an individual have been accused of causing this accident. It is now the duty of the plaintiff's attorney to have convinced you that they do not do their duty or act properly resulting in the accident. Your concern is not to speculate with regard to the facts in this case. 
Your concern is to determine whether the individual driving the car acted properly while driving. You must find whether the company should be responsible for the acts committed by this individual. What is important is determining whether this individual acted on behalf of the company in driving in this manner. It is not for you to speculate whether there were others involved. It is true that others may have participated in the accident, but they are not involved in this trial today. It is not your responsibility to speculate into these matters. The evidence brought forth regarding others is not important in this case. This case is about the accident that occurred using a company car and whether the company has responsibility in this regard. As I indicated, the person accused is not determined to be responsible until you make your decision in that regard. When you make your decision in this regard, you must also decide the part that the company played and what its responsibility was or wasn't. You have heard the testimony of the witnesses who have identified the individual and gave testimony with regard to the accident. It is now your opportunity to, dis to decide whether the plaintiff's attorney has presented a convincing case. It is up to you to decide whether this individual was responsible for the crime. You must also decide the position of the responsibility that the company bears in this regard. You have read the testimony of not only these individuals, but of all the others who had evidence to present to the court. After hearing the evidence, it is up to you to decide how to vote. You must not have any prejudice because you are dealing with a business entity. Now for some literary practice. This is called Don't Let Fear Rob You. Ready? Here we go. This morning I was sitting in church waiting for the 8 a.m. service to begin when I noticed two women walk past me down the aisle and sit in front of the LCD monitor. I thought to myself, I sure hope they don't expect to see CART because I only provide that for the 9.30 a.m. service. I'm not ready. I've only warmed up my wrapping by wrapping my hands around a hot cup of coffee. I practice writing the 8 a.m. sermon, stopping to brief a recurring word or phrase or to jot down an unfamiliar word that I will Google in between services. If there is an emotional testimony, I may just sit back and take it in before I start writing again. I walked down to the two women, smiled and introduced myself. I asked if they were expecting to use the text on the screen as an accommodation to hear the service. Terry and Debbie, who I found out were mother and daughter, returned my smile and said yes. I found myself apologizing that I didn't normally provide cart for the 8 a.m. service and explaining that it would be better for them to attend the next. But then I stopped. What on earth was I thinking? Was it the purpose of my captioning ministry anyway? It's to make the word of God accessible. Why would I deny anyone that? I love this ministry. When did fear start robbing me of what I love to do? I thought back to the spring of 1987. I had recently moved back to Wisconsin after graduating from a court reporting school in California. A job offer was posted for a secretary stenographer with real-time skills to work for the Honorable Judge Richards as Richard S. Brown in the Court of Appeals. I jumped at the opportunity. I had a good feeling I had passed the Wisconsin State CRR, Certified Professional Reporter Exam, required to work in state courts and was awaiting results, but I was nervous, maybe even terrified. However, I wasn't going to let fear stop me from an incredible job opportunity. I had no previous experience. I had no computer system, no dictionary. As I was still typing from my paper notes using my manual steno machine, what I lacked in experience and skill I made up for in sheer determination and willingness to learn. It never occurred to me that I couldn't do it. I just needed the opportunity. 
I don't remember much about the actual interview, but it must have gone well because later that same day I received a phone call offering me the position. I was elated. I wasted no time finding a computer system and spending every spare minute building my dictionary. Although I considered myself a clean writer, I needed to be real-time ready. You see, Judge Brown is deaf. I needed to be able to write real-time for oral arguments in the courtroom and judicial conference calls in chambers utilizing the speakerphone. So why this morning, after years of experience, did I almost allow fear to hinder the purpose of my captioning ministry? Fear can impede our growth if we are obsessed with what others may think of us. If our focus is on ourselves and our glory, we don't see the glory of God working through us as his messenger to reach out to others. to some jury charge practice. And the subject of this jury charge is arson. Ready? Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, the plaintiff in this case is charged by the defendant with having committed a criminal act, the act of arson. In a case of this kind, the presumption of innocence exists and the improbability that one will commit a crime is an element here involved which should be considered by you with all the other evidence in the case. After viewing the whole case with such carefulness as the gravity of the subject demands, the issue should be determined in accordance with the preponderance of the proof. A fraud is never presumed and must be proved. If the fire was seen to break out in two or more places at about the same time at points distant from each other, it is for you to say whether or not those fires were started by human agency or whether it was accident or misfortune that started them. That is a question of fact for you to determine. The principal question in this case is whether or not the fire originated by any act, design, or procurement on the part of the plaintiff or through any act done or suffered by his privity or with his consent. In deciding this question, you should take into account every fact and incident connected with the fire and subsequent transactions transactions as detailed in the evidence. However, if you have heard any evidence in this case which the court afterwards struck out, you are to wholly disregard such evidence in arriving at your verdict. In giving these instructions, it is the intention of the court simply to instruct the jury as to the law applicable to the case, but it is not the intention of the court in the least degree to give the jury any opinion as to whether or not the defendant is guilty of the offense charged in the indictment or to express any opinion as to the weight or sufficiency of the testimony or as to the credibility of any witness. Our literary. Don't let fear rob you. Ready? Fear can also cause us to refuse to embrace things because we would rather be comfortable. If we become complacent in our work, it will lead to dissatisfaction, feeling unfulfilled, and eventual burnout. Eugene O'Neill said a man's work is in danger of deteriorating when he thinks he has found the one best formula for doing it. If he thinks that, he is likely to feel that all he needs is merely to go on repeating himself. So long as a person is searching for better ways of doing his work, he is fairly safe. There are online tools, classes, and webinars that are fantastic resources. In the comfort of my home, away from distractions, I set aside time to take a course and practice. The most difficult part is just making yourself sit down and begin, but you'll be amazed at how quickly you become engaged and how fun it is, especially when you see the improvement in your skills. 
There is also a tremendous benefit in attending on-site workshops and conventions. You will always come away with an immense amount of information, education, and training in a short period of time. It is rejuvenating to interact with peers, giving and receiving support and sharing what works. Having several vendors at one location is a time saver, assisting you in making informed decisions on your wants and needs. Contact your church or any local church and ask if you can set up your equipment to practice for yourself. Search out sermons on TV or on the web. My church has sermon videos to watch and downloads available in video and audio format on its home page. Edmund Burke once said, The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Have you ever watched babies learning to walk? They take a step and down they go. They get up and take another step or two and down they go. Never do they look discouraged. Never do they give up. They just get up and take another step forward. And before you know it, they're running. You don't think there are days in court when I cringed at my untranslates or word boundary issues? Absolutely, but I got up, dusted off my ego, and kept working hard, always moving forward. Don't let fear rob you of your aspirations. Don't let your fear deny others the opportunity to hear the word of God. Take that first baby step toward making it happen. After the sermon this morning, Terry, Debbie, and I had a chance to talk. They thanked me and gave me a hug saying they truly appreciated the cart and would be back next week. I look forward to seeing them, and if they happen to come for the 8 a.m. service, that will be just fine. some jury charge practice. Ready? Here we go. In criminal cases, the people are considered the plaintiffs. Before a trial, a person charged with a crime is given an opportunity to make a plea. It is the people, not an individual, who are bringing forth the action. The people are the individuals who are represented by an attorney. An attorney appointed by the state is chosen as a representative of the state. At the trial, the people bring forth the suit, but it is up to the jury to decide the guilt of the party who has been charged. The jury will make the decision whether the person is guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. The jury may decide that the individual is not guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. The attorneys who represented the state in this criminal case presented enough evidence to convince the jury of the person's guilt. The defendant was confined to prison. The defendant received a reprieve because new evidence was found. The defendant was granted the reprieve while the new evidence was being examined. The defendant must be shown to be guilty beyond all reasonable doubt in the case. If this is the case, the results will be that the defendant is found to be not guilty. The jury was convinced beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's innocence. It could not find in favor of the defendant for this reason. The defendant was sent to the penitentiary without any opportunity for parole. The attorneys that represented both sides were convinced of their positions. The jury decided the facts in the case based upon the evidence presented in court. The new evidence was not available until the defendant had been convicted and was in prison. With the new evidence, the defendant was able to get a reprieve. The order was granted by the governor. The governor is the only one who can grant a reprieve in cases such as this. Evidence presented in testimony at trial was called into question. Testimony consists of the words of the witness taken down while the witness is under oath. In addition to testimony as a means of offering evidence to the court, the attorneys had any numbers of different types of exhibits to use as proof of their positions. Both sides had many exhibits to support their sides. The new evidence was determined only after the jury had decided the case. What followed was that their was an absolute pardon of the defendant. 
When testimony is entered into evidence by the plaintiff, that evidence is used to prove the plaintiff's case. Only new evidence can change the decision of the jury. The defendant was released from confinement only after the new evidence in the case was examined. During the trial, the witnesses were called, starting with the witness for the state. The state had to put on a good case to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. The state first presented one of its witnesses and questioned the witness under oath. Right, that will conclude our literary and jury charge practice.